The following is for information purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. All opinions and views expressed by the contributors to this podcast are in a personal capacity only. They do not represent the views of Progressive Equity Research or any other organization mentioned in this podcast. Okay, so we're on Thursday, the 5th of September. Hi, Jeremy. Good to have you back again. Hi, Gareth. Yeah, good to be here. So it's been a, a shorter week this week, but still quite a bit going on. Well, certainly in the US it has been, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we had not much from a macro perspective on Monday, but there's, I think, a bit of an echo of the start of August happening in the first week of September. We've had a strengthening dollar month to date. Uh, we've had weaker oil prices, uh, continuingly weak oil prices and weak commodity prices generally. And there's been a, an increasingly sort of risk-off mood to markets. And I think investors historically are wary of September because historically it is the most volatile month of the year. And it's beginning to shape up in that way, whether it's going to continue in this manner I don't know, but it certainly started in a rather nervy way. We got to a point where yesterday the sort of deja vu from the beginning of August continued. We had something like a 4% fall in Japanese equities overnight last night. And by my calculation, with the weakness in the MAG7 and with NVIDIA in particular, NVIDIA has given up something like half a trillion dollars worth in market value month to date. And what are we only five days in? So a big um, fall. Yeah. yeah. So there's quite a bit going on in sort of market moves and, the, and sentiment. We've had a bit of a move up in the VIX volatility index, which spiked dramatically, as you would recall, during the carry trade crisis a month ago. That started to sort of creep higher this week. And uh, so pretty shaky start to the month, the first few days of September. But from a UK perspective, the value of the pound has held up. And by all accounts, the UK Treasury has executed quite a well-supported guilt auction as well. So amidst all this, the UK continues from a global investor's perspective to have these safe haven attributes that I think those of us who live in this country sometimes find a bit confusing and a bit hard to understand. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't yeah. feel perfect here, but on a global view, we're doing not too badly. Yes. That would be the yeah. take. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you think people are thinking about in terms of the UK? How are we feeling as a market? I think in terms of reading RNSs and trying to get one's head around what companies are saying, I think it's all pretty much in order. But I think from an investor perspective, I think there's quite a bit of concern building around what's lined up for us in October in the budget. People are expecting, and I think they've been guided to expect, higher capital gains tax. So I think one of the reasons the UK equity market is sort of churning along a bit is because people are getting their gains in before whatever comes in October comes. And there's increasing chatter around the outlook for IHT relief for business property, which includes the IHT AIM exposure, which I think if they did do something sort of precipitous on that front, it would clearly be very negative for the UK small cap, particularly the AIM market, obviously. Absolutely. There are a lot of funds that invest specifically for those purposes. So yeah. any, any major changes to those rules would be very badly received. I would say that could be quite a counterproductive move, but obviously they've, they've got to balance the book somehow and there's lots to be done. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of speculation around what's coming in October and I think that's something we're just going to have to get through. So what have you been looking at this week in the UK? Well, as you said, I think the corporate landscape has been not too bad. And yes, investors might have worries about the tax treatment of their investments or, or otherwise. But in terms of the companies themselves, yeah, it's, it's been not a bad week, really. We kicked off on Monday with Virtue Motors, a uh, large automotive retailer. They had a trading update out for the five months through to July. And although the new car market is still struggling, because I think, as I say, anyone anyway, we discussed previously, that the government's effectively trying to regulate people into not buying petrol cars anymore. 
and people themselves have already decided to not buy electric ones. So yes. there's a challenge there for the car retailers in, in the new market. But luckily for Virtue, the used car market has been holding up quite nicely. Prices have stabilized. There's there are better levels of activity there. And Virtue is also doing very well in its after sales business. So for them, they're navigating their way through. But what is obviously quite a tricky car retail space at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. That was Monday. Tuesday, we had STV, the Scottish broadcaster. But obviously, they're making increasingly rapid moves towards more content production and becoming more of a streaming platform. And, and their first half results showed more continuation of those nice trends. They were boosted reasonably significantly by the Euros football tournament, which yes. helped them out quite a bit. But underlying that were some really good trends. They've got a new CEO, Rufus Radcliffe, coming in later in the year. So it'll be interesting to see you know, how he can take that forward because there have been a, a lot of positives recently and hopefully there's a lot more to go from them over the, the coming quarters. So it's a nice update from STV. And then the last one is a business concurrent technologies that manufactures quite niche IT hardware products, cards, which go into generally rugged componentry for the defense marketplace in particular tanks, I think also some aircraft, but it's mainly a, a land-based hardware modular platform that they produce into. I went along to a very well attended analyst meeting on Monday. They've essentially seen a pretty buoyant defense market, which is obviously for you know sad and disappointing reasons, but nevertheless, there are a lot of things being bought and procured. And Miles and Kim have been in charge of that business now for between two and three years. And I think they're really starting to see some of the benefits of the, the changes that they've put in place. In particular, they've been making a big shift from selling just these one-off cards and you know, relatively small components to fuller, what they call systems, uh, which is a bigger cell. It does take longer to design in. It's, it's a more complicated, slightly more complex procurement cycle. But once you're in, once you're designed in to your customer's product, in these cases, presumably quite significant defense assets of whatever type, yep. you're in there for many years. And they've seen a rapidly increasing number of what they call major design wins, which is kind of a technical phrase that they use for anything which is worth more than a million pounds a year. They've seen a really rapid growth in those. They signed eight in the whole of 2023, and they signed another eight in just the first half of 2024. So they're seeing a really strong growth in those design wins, which obviously bodes very well for future year's revenues as those layer on and they, they stay designed into those customer products and they just gradually build revenues over time. Are those design wins coming from the U? Because they acquired a US business about this time last year, I recall. They did. And yeah, it's a mixture and that they're definitely seeing the benefits of being seen, I think, as a slightly more US business. I mean, obviously yes. the US defense procurement, they like to see American customers. They like to see American businesses supplying them. And yep. that acquisition, I think, is, is already very much proving its worth in, in that context. So they're, they're seeing some good results from there as well. So yeah, lots to look forward to. What have you seen in terms of the UK market? Anything particular caught your eye? Yeah, there's been quite a few things, but the one that I thought was worth having a chat about today, we got a pretty positive update from ASOS, the online clothing retailer, which has been over the last couple of years, it and its competitor Boohoo have both been really under the cosh. And I thought it was just interesting today that ASOS announced three or four sort of interesting aspects to its update. It's sort of restructuring itself financially by raising more capital, this time via a convertible bond, which looks quite interesting. It's also refinanced its holding of Topshop, which it bought in 2021. And it's done a JV deal with its shareholder, it's the Polson family. And it also was talking in its trading update that although it guided slightly below on revenues, that it expect profitability to be at the top end of the consensus range of estimates. I don't know how wide that range is, but it's the first sort of piece of positive news. And there, I think there are several aspects to it from not just this company, but this sector for a number of years. Now, it and any retailer importing into the UK should actually be seeing a bit of a benefit at the moment because of the relative strength of sterling. The thing that caught my eye on it was the thing they said about the adoption of AI in their business, where they said it had increased their ability to um, personalize and improve the imagery they send to their customers, which has not just improved the customer experience, but it's also reduced the actual and underlying returns rate year on year, which is a critical component of the cost of running a business like this. So 
I think these businesses have been under the cosh for some time. They're not great businesses in terms of their margin structure, but there is evidence here that maybe the worst is over. Yeah, that is interesting. It's, it's nice to see AI being talked about in, in a sort of positive business improvement fashion rather than just looking to cut costs and, and remove people. It's quite nice to see the, the upside of it. Yeah, and I, I just think from a number of things you see and hear now, well, there's a sort of top-down fear out there of, and you know, we've seen it in the volatility of the Mac 7 and particularly NVIDIA since their results and you know, in this period of market uncertainty. Well, the sort of top-down concerns about the big AI players slowly but surely, and actually maybe not quite so slowly, maybe more quickly than we realize, companies like Assos, like Klarna, like Windward are adopting AI in their business and making material changes. And it's not going to be too long before this comes through in the macro aggregate economic data, maybe sooner than we all think. No, absolutely. I mean, there should be real societal benefits from this. And Things like this, if we if we can start to see those going through, that'll be the really positive. And then maybe the justification will be there for the valuations of all the Mag Seven. So who knows? Uh, be, you never know. Be nice to see. Good stuff. Okay. And uh, what have we got lined up for next week? I think next week's going to be very interesting. And I think before we get there, people will be aware that we've had U.S. jobs numbers, and we're going to get non-farm payrolls, and we're going to get the August unemployment number. I think now that Jay Powell has told us that he no longer cares about inflation, he only cares about the job market, I've exaggerated a little bit, we need a Goldilocks number tomorrow, by which I mean one where the economy is slowing sufficiently to justify the rate cuts, which have already been priced in, by the way, but not so weak that we get fears of a hard landing and a major recession on our hands. So the more I think about it, the problem I have is that I don't know where the landing zone is for that number. I don't know what that number is. It's hard to see a number where the market says, hmm, that's really good. That's positive. So I don't want to be too negative, but I think we could be in this period of directionless sort of market grinding away for some time. You know, the, the problem with jobs market data is that it's notoriously inaccurate. It's always historically revised. And it's measuring something that's a lagging measure. So, yeah, that's tomorrow. And looking into next week, we get UK unemployment on Tuesday, which the expectation is to get a flat number, unchanged number at 4.2%. And on Wednesday, we get UK GDP data for July, which should see a small tick up from the flat figure in June. And I think the expectation here is for about a month-on-month growth of 0.2%, which should keep things ticking along if that comes in. But then we get US inflation data for August on Wednesday as well, which is expected to see quite a significant fall, actually, on the year-on-year rate from 2.9% last time to 2.6%. Problem here is we already know that inflation is beaten because Jay Powell has told us, and therefore... (laughs) A, you could say it doesn't matter, but if it's a strong print, it's going to create more runs. As in a high number feels like inflation is not beaten after all. That would be scary. Yeah, That would be scary. So I think that's something to look out for. And we also have a rate decision from the ECB on Thursday. Quite interestingly, we didn't mention it, but this week, Canada has now cut rates for the third straight month. And I think it's likely that the ECB will follow suit. I think it'll cut rates next week from 4.25% to 4%. And as we go through this month, I think we'll get the Bank of England and the Fed following suit. And as I said, we should do because we've already discounted it. It's priced in. So yeah. the market's expecting that, aren't they? So, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully that comes through and uh, we'll catch up this time next week and talk through that and potentially the fallout if the US jobs numbers aren't exactly in that very small sweet spot that you've described. So yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Good stuff. Great talking to you and we'll catch up next week. Talk to you then. Thanks. See you then. Bye. Brought to you by Progressive Equity. 